Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm class of 1980. My wife, Carol, graduated in 1982. My son, Grant, graduated from the law school last year with a JD MBA. And then my other son, Danny, graduated last year in liberal arts. And I have a daughter who's a junior at Villanova. So we're a full Villanova family. And I feel like I'm minority here tonight. I'm not used to this. Um, <laughs> But before, I didn't know what I was getting myself involved with. Mary Kelly called me or emailed me this afternoon, and I'm a replacement for Bruce Sham. And I just want to say I'm honored to be here. I think it's um, a wonderful involvement and organization. And um, I think it's great that you, all of you girls are taking part in this. You know, they're, they're tremendous figures in the business world today. Sheryl Sandberg, it, uh, Chief Operating Officer at Facebook. Um, the CEO of IBM is a woman. Uh, Marissa Meyer, the CEO of Yahoo. So I don't look at it as a minority um, discriminatory environment in the business world, although I'm not a woman. But I've never, I, I, don't, I don't look at a woman as, uh, because she's a woman, she has um, a leg down on me. I, I think she, it's a very, very competitive environment. And the skill set that you bring to the work environment is what's going to make you a success or a failure. Okay. So I'm going to change my whole format. I'm going to tell you how I began. I started on Wall Street as a janitor. Okay. My summer job in college was a janitor on Wall Street. And, I, and I'd see all these lawyers and stock traders walking on to New York, the New York Stock Exchange or the different office buildings on Wall Street. And I was so impressed by it. So it, it, it brought a passion to me about being on Wall Street. And my father was a banker. He worked at Citibank. And he actually discouraged me from becoming a broker on Wall Street. And the first lesson here is follow your passion. No one else's but your passion. Okay. The other thing that was so important to my career was with my own children, with my own children's friends. Um, they're always looking for the adults as a networking vehicle to find a job. My networking vehicle was my friends, my friends that graduated from Villanova. The, uh, whether it was, you know, when we're all looking for a job, if we're all in the same class, we have to look for upperclassmen to give us some guidance or mentoring. So if you're in a sorority, or if you're in a business organization that, you know, seniors that are, have graduated, what, what's the majority of the age here? What, what, what years are we? Freshmen? Who's a freshman? Who's a sophomore? Who's a junior? Who's a senior? Okay. So the seniors, for example, when they were freshmen and sophomores, if they knew girls that graduated that are now starting their careers and doing well and, and the field that they're in is of some interest, contact them. That will help you going out. Um, you know, you learn, the biggest lessons you learn is not by your successes, it's by your failures. But the key is not to be bogged down in your failures, to learn from them and don't be afraid of them and keep moving forward and be open to the challenges. Because it, it, the, the failures are what get you to the next level, to, to change course, to, make, to look at opportunities in different, different ways than you looked at it before. Okay. Now, for investing at your age, it's simple. It's very, very simple. Just put some money aside and invest in the market. If your great-grandfather invested $1,000 in Coca-Cola, it'd be worth something like $250 million today. Okay. So 
if when you get out into the work world, immediately sign up for 401k plans, which are normally self-funded retirement plans that most corporations offer. Um, and they'll have a matching program along with that. And that's probably pretty much the first thing to do. Look at real estate ventures. I mean, if, if I was in your shoes right now, I'd be looking at little houses in Bryn Mawr to buy up and rent out as rental properties. Um, think along the lines of how you're going to make a return on your investment from a cash flow standpoint or from a capital appreciation standpoint. But it, it's, it, the important thing is to save and start saving, start a discipline very early in life to save money. Now, I, I brought out this um, because I didn't know what, what this program involved. And I have these handouts. And this is somewhat in, more involved than, I, than after sitting through this program, um, I want to bring up. But I, I'm, I'm going to share with, share with them anyway, share, share these articles or charts with you. So I think it's important. Who's a finance major? Okay. <laughs> Who has an interest in the stock market? Okay. I'm going to make the analogy of bull markets and bear markets to a Friday night party at Villanova. Okay. <laughs> Secular bull markets are great parties. The best parties you can be to. In the beginning of bull markets, investors are wary and they want to take the edge off. As the bull market proceeds, above average returns become intoxicating. By the time it's over, the past decade has delivered bountiful returns. Now what I'm talking about is I'm talking about 1982 to 2000 was one of the biggest bull markets, well it was the biggest bull market in the history of the stock market. If you look at that chart right here, Okay, this is Crestmont Research. Okay, 1982 to 1999, it was up 1,214%. Okay, in contrast, bear markets are like hangovers. They are awakening that strip away the intoxication, leaving a sobering need for, a one, for an understanding of what just happened. All right. Now, what was a bear market? Your parents, 2000, 2002 period. What caused it? Euphoria mainly. Market price earnings ratios went to 45 times earnings. Okay. Price earnings ratio is simply take the price of a stock, you divide the earnings, and that's what the ratio is. Okay. Normally, stock markets trade around 15 times in good, stable economic environments. What influences stock prices? The biggest influence is probably inflation. Okay. When you have low inflation, a moderate growth economy, and low interest rates, that's the perfect scenario for a good stock market. When you have hyperinflation or deflation, that's the worst environment for a stock market. And why? Because in a slow growth, low inflationary environment, you have no competition for asset classes. Okay? Let's take today. What's a CD paying? Does anyone know? Less than 1%. What's General Electric pay paying as a dividend? Close to 3%, with an upside potential of capital appreciation. So you're tripling your rate of return by buying one of the highest quality companies in the United States. 
or in the world for that matter. Okay, so in that environment, that's the perfect environment for the stock market. What are we in today? Well, it's a lot easier to pick. I shouldn't say that. It's a lot easier from a valuation standpoint to pick a stock in a bear market. For example, GE was trading at $60 a share when we were talking about that 1990, the 82 to 1999 bull market. GE traded down to $6 a share back in 2008. Why? Mainly because of their financial exposure, their finance arm. What did Citigroup trade at? 50-something, went down to two. Bank of America, 50-something, down to five. Any financial firm or any firm that had exposure to finances was down precipitously. So what do you buy in, the, in this horrible bear market? It's fairly easy. You buy consumer staple stocks. You buy the Procter & Gamble's. You buy the Colgate Palmolives. You buy the Johnson and Johnsons. Because in serious bear markets, all boats sink. In serious bull markets, all boats rise. All right. And what is Johnson and Johnson now? It's probably tripled. What is Procter and Gamble? Tripled. Yeah. And what's the? And when you bought those stocks, the dividend yield was probably three and a half, four percent. So, in reality, secular bull and bear periods are driven by long-term trends in the inflation rate, okay? Because the inflation rate has the greatest influence on interest rates. If inflation is high, interest rates are going to climb. If inflation is low, interest rates are going to be low. And who controls interest rates? Who? Right. So, you know, the market on a daily basis, the, the reason why you can't put a model to the stock market is because the caveat of the psychological also is involved in the, in the valuation of stock prices. So, what do we have today? Okay, we have low interest rates, we have very low inflation, we have a market that's trading at around 15, 16 times earnings. Some stocks are a lot higher. Facebook is trading at 40 times earnings. Um, why isn't the stock market trading at 20, 25 times earnings? It's a perfect environment for stocks. I'm asking, I'm asking that as a question. Why? Give me a reason why. Why isn't the stock market, because of the environment that I, we just talked about, for bull markets, low interest rates, low inflation, a fairly valued market, not undervalued, but a fairly valued, why isn't the stock market trading at 20 times, 25 times earnings? Market got as high as 45 times earnings in 1999. Right, that's psychological part. What causes that psychological part? Washington, is that an unknown? The debt crisis, the debt situation, the European situation. You know, the, there's always concern of China. Is China going to tighten? Is that going to slow down global global growth? So. The most recent party the market ran, went through, as we talked about, was the late 1990s. It was completely intoxication. And what we've just experienced from 2000 to 2013, what do you think the market's up in that period of time? From this great bull market, we're up 1,200%. 
What do you think the market's up? The S&P, S&P 500. Is everyone familiar with the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, NASDAQ? Maybe about 2%. Two percent. Okay. If you believe in statistics and reversion back to the mean, historically stocks have given us 10, 11 percent. So we have a great opportunity ahead. And that's the argument of the bull and bear case. The bear case is stocks are fairly valued here. There's a lot of uncertainty out there. Interest rates could go back up. The Fed has printed so much money. We have $18 trillion in debt going to 20. What happens if the Fed starts to taper? Where do interest rates go? Okay. Will that slow down the economy? Will that slow down earnings? That's the bear case. The bull case is markets 15 times earnings. Look at past bull markets when we had low inflation, low interest rates. We got as high as 40, 45 times earnings. What's normal in that type of period is probably 20 to 25 times earnings. My question is where's the growth going to come from? Well, the talk is that the growth is going to come from the emerging markets. Okay, there's $12 trillion spent in emerging markets now. There's a whole new global middle class coming about in China, in India, in Vietnam, in countries that um, I don't need, I'm not even mentioning, Indonesia. So that, that $12 trillion is going to turn into $25 trillion in consumption in 2025. We're becoming energy independent. We heard about all this Marcellus shale being developed. Manufacturing is starting to come back to the United States because of the lower energy costs. If we're energy independent, what is that going to mean for the Middle East? What is that going to mean for the whole global stage? Is the Middle East become obsolete? Do we have to spend any resources in militarily or socially to be involved with the Middle East, or can we scale back? So those are all bullish arguments. Yeah. I'm looking out here, I'm very bullish on the U.S. economy, because I'm looking at you people. I see tremendous amount of potential. So. That's all I have. Any questions? Carol. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> Carol is working with me now. She was an accounting major at Villanova, and um, she was like my father. She decided to come to the, <laughs> to the financial services industry. Um, I was just going to say, why don't you tell the girls about um, just how quickly, how you got your job in the, you know, how you got to Wall Street. And then, um, you know, just what, um, I'm going to say, tell that, and then I'll think of a second question. <laughs> okay. How I got to Wall Street. Well, my first job was actually in shipping. I was in sales in a shipping company called U.S. Lines. And um, it probably hired 70% of my friends in New York and at Villanova. And... One of the reasons why I didn't try to get a job on Wall Street was because of my father. I listened to him um, because he was a detriment to that. He, he kind of squashed my passion. So, but I knew that shipping wasn't the right industry. So my first job, I graduated in 1980. I, I started working at U.S. Lines in 1980. I went to Payne Weber in 1983, and how I got my job at Payne Weber was from a Villanova classmate. He was on a trading desk in New York, and um, I wanted to move. I was living in New York. I'm from New York originally, and I wanted to get out of New York. Carol was living down in Philadelphia. We were getting very serious, 
and I thought this was I thought this was a good option for me to move to Philadelphia. So I was hired by Payne Weber, and the manager of the Payne Weber office opened up the Merrill Lynch office in Valley Forge, and he he recruited me over in uh, 1987, and I stayed there until 2008. And why I switched from Merrill Lynch to Morgan Stanley was I was concerned about, we all know about the, um, the mortgage crisis and the subpar prime loans. And, and, uh, and I just had a, an instinct. My intuition told me something wasn't right. And this is where you have to follow your intuition. I got a, it was interesting because I got a letter from Morgan Stanley saying that they wanted to meet me and talk to me to explore opportunities. And I've always gotten letters like that. But I was open to it because I was concerned about Merrill Lynch. So we started talking and negotiating and uh, this, this started in April. And I left Merrill Lynch in August. Um, so my point is, take your time when you're making big career changes or any big decisions. Take your time, think about it. Ask for God's guidance. That's important too. And um, any major decision that you face. And then follow your instinct. Carol. My other question was, why don't you tell them how, like, when you started out with, like, a zero book and how you, like, you, oh. your first year, like, cold calling and all that stuff. When I left U.S. Lines, Olivia was talking about what pay cut she took. I was making $45,000 a year, and my first year in the brokerage business, I was making thirteen. That was a big drop. <laughs> but I didn't think about the money. I thought about the career, and I knew I had what it, what it, what was needed <coughs> to be successful. So don't think about the money, especially in your 20s. Think about the career. Think about the career path. And the important thing is that you want to build your career path. You know, what I find with Friend, I'm 55. What I find with friends my age that have jumped careers and jumped careers and jumped careers, they, they've, they haven't built anything. You know, you need to, as long as you find your passion, okay, which is, which is hard at your age, but if you find your passion, then it will build. You will build. Like I switched, I've been working for three firms, but I stayed in the same industry, and I built on that. Yes, Michelle. You talked a little bit about what you advise clients to do in a, a bear market. What's your advice in more of a bullish market? Well, you know, you have to weigh the risk profile of each individual client. Let's say we have an aggressive young client like yourself. I'd be fully invested in the equity market. Okay. You don't need bonds at this time. You need capital appreciation. You need wealth. Wealth creation to buy your house, your first house. Um, and the stock market, I mean, if you look at rates of return, the stock market yields 10%. Bonds have yield something like 2%. It's a wide discrepancy over time. Any, uh, yes, Denise. Um, let's say our students here upon graduation, you know, accumulate some money from relatives. Um, what might one want to do at this age um, with, say, a couple thousand dollars? What, what might be one thing they could do? Well, I, th I, th I think they need to um, leave it completely liquid until they're moved into their apartments or if they're living at home and find out exactly what their budget is. And then after they've 
live for, let's say, five or six months and see if they're in a net surplus position, mm -hmm. then they can look to invest. So just to clarify, you didn't say to spend all of it. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I just want to make that. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I wish you all the best of luck. I think Villanova, when I came to Villanova, was commerce and finance. Some people used to call it, what was it? CNF. CNF Comics and Frolics or something. Uh, <laughs> 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 and, and this class, or the students here today, are a lot more impressive than the group of students that I went to school with. And we all did very well for ourselves. So you're going to do fine. Just don't be afraid. You know, be fearless in your passion, in your careers, and you'll do great. Okay? Thanks.